Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast again. And this is another article review. So what I wanted to start to try doing <laughs> moving into 2021 is instead of waiting till the end of the year and recording all those videos of the articles uh, that I, I liked like I did last time, I'm going to try to uh, review an article a week, right, to put out a video review of one article uh, that I find every week. And so if there's any that you find that the, you're listening and any that you would like me to have a go at, please take in mind my interests, right? I don't, I don't really want to do something way outside of what, what I generally do. Uh, but if you think there's something interesting, uh, definitely shoot it my way and I will, I will have a look. So that's kind of where this is the first and hopefully a long series of uh, weekly article reviews. So in this one, I want to review a paper uh, that's interesting in its own sake, but I think is really important for introducing kind of a new way of thinking about skill acquisition research, which, which the authors call contextualized skill ac acquisition research. So in the constraints, that constraints approach and the constraints model, Newell's constraints model, obviously, you know, we have these three constraints that shape the emergence of, of movement and coordination, uh, the task constraints, the individual organism constraints, and the environmental constraints. In this today, we want to focus on environmental constraints, and those can be further split into two types, right? Physical environmental constraints, which we talk about a lot, things like wind, playing surface, and things like that. And things we know are important, but we don't really study and, and talk about a lot are the social cultural constraints, uh, right? That, sh that an athlete or a performer is embedded in, right? So things we're talking about here are the values, the ethos, the support, uh, like family and social support a player has, their access to playing surf uh, playing uh, surfaces, uh, uh, you know, um, facilities and so on. So obviously all of these things are also gonna shape how, a, a, you know, the skill involves in a certain performer along with the other more specific things we tend to think about like the other tasks and environmental constraints. So trying to understand how this shapes skill is obviously really important but it's a very challenging thing. But one way we can think about this and put it all together is using a, a phrase that you'll hear a fair bit if you go into the ecological approach and, and, and active reproach and things like that, is this phrase, form of life. And this is from Wittgenstein in 1953. Basically, the form of life, what it's meant to um, mean, it's what its meaning is, is it's the kind of the behaviors, the capacities, the attitudes, and all these things that shape the community we live in, okay? So it's, you can think of it as the environmental constraints, the social, cultural, historical, political constraints that define a culture, a team, a group, and so on. As an example of this, I, I, I like to use uh, an experience I had when I was uh, in, in, a teenager in high school. So uh, one winter, um, when I was uh, living with my parents, obviously, we had a team hockey team visit us from Sweden, right? So they came and, and played some games in, in our area. Um, and also they, they did what was called billeting. So they split up the team and they stayed with families. Each player stayed with one of the families on our team. So we had, we had a, a, my friend and I who live across the street, street, each had one of the players stay with us. And in my friend's basement was uh, a what we called a ping pong table, right? So ping pong in our form of life, kind of the, the way that we thought about things, the culture in Canada was a game that you occasionally play for fun in your basement, right? Um, it's just like, you know, horseshoes or darts. Like it's it's kind of a game that you don't take too seriously. Um, you don't, you just kind of play it. It's a fun thing. Um, I, so we one evening we the we went to my friend's house and we, and we said you know why don't we play with these pl the hockey players from Sweden, and we quickly learned that they had a very different form of life in which that thing is called table tennis, which is a serious sport, right? So they destroyed us. <laughs> it was it was could not even play. We we played a couple games and then we sat back and watched them, right? So. The form of life, how we view uh, our, our certain things, our customs, you know, how it shaped our culture, solely shaped how our skill developed, right? How good we were and coordinated we were with a with a table tennis or ping pong racket. 
right? So that's just one example. So I think this is a really, really important uh, topic to study. And as I said, a really challenging one. So the paper I'm gonna talk about today is actually a, a work that builds on a, a series of studies um, by Yuhara and colleagues, one of which I reviewed previously in episode 128 in the podcast, if you wanna go listen. In that study, the authors talk about how the, uh, the traditional, the way that uh, the may mostly access and the, uh, shapes the coordination pattern in Brazilian soccer players. So in these studies, um, that study and the one we're going to talk about today, we're talking about soccer players in Brazil. The reason the authors chose this, and I think it was a smart choice, right? They're choosing something where it's obviously clear that there's something associated with that culture that we can define, right? And I'll talk about it in a minute. But most people know, if you're a soccer fan at all, that Brazilian players are associated with this particular style of play that's different from people that come from other cultures and other countries, right? So the, we're starting for some, with something where there's an obvious, clear, big difference, right? And trying to understand it, which, which is a good place to start. But in this article, they talk about how the, the uh, tradition of playing pelada, which is basically pickup soccer, um, it shaped the coordination and the style of Brazilian players, right? They emphasize that Pilata, a lot of kids in, in rural areas of Brazil don't have access to nice manicured fields uh, like uh, kids in a traditional soccer academy do. Instead, they play wherever they can on the beach and the street. Um, they, they often have unequal number of players or not enough players, players of different age, gender. They mix all these things in. And they're making the argument and a very valid one that these kind of, uh, you know, deficiencies in, in access really are, were beneficial because they're creating a lot of variability in the practice conditions, creating adaptive, creative players and so on. So, so have a listen to that or read that article. It's a really interesting article. This one, a uh, newer one that just came out late at the end of 2020, um, they are wanted to look more specifically at how the actual culture and history of Brazil has shaped um, their play. Uh, and they're going to focus on two particular things in, in Brazil. And excuse my pronunciation, I'll try. Malandragam and Jinga, okay, um, which they are identifying as things that shape uh, the, the style of Brazilian players. And as I mentioned, they chose Brazilian players because it's widely recognized that Brazilian players play in a different way. The phrase sometimes that, that you hear is jogo bonito, which means in Portuguese means play beautifully, right? So um, not only are Brazilian soccer teams usually good, like they win a lot, but they also play with more a typical, more flair, more um, you know, style, more you know, um, deception, more fancy moves, whatever you want to call it, than teams from other countries like, I'll just pick Germany, right? Which emphasizes more precision and timing and doing, you know, passing and things like that. They emphasize, obviously emphasize much more style and flair, right? So that's what they're trying to understand how their culture has shaped this behavior, right? So their main research question, how have the social cultural constraints of Brazil led to the emergence of this movement solutions they use, this particular style, this be playing beautifully, or, you know, stated in a more simply way, why do they play the way they do? And as I said, this is a really difficult question to answer, right? Because it's a very complex question. And it, we're not talking about manipulating a, one constraint like, you know, the size of the ball or, or the weight of the racket. We're talking about the effect of a whole culture or in society, right? So it's a challenging thing. So to address this, the authors develop and discuss this new approach they're talking about. They call it contextualized skill acquisition research. And in the paper, I would really recommend you go read it. They go and talk about all the, the philosophies and, and different previous research that they use to develop this theory. But I'm just going to pick out some features that kind of resonated with me and I thought were critical. The biggest thing that's different about this um, contextualized skill acquisition research, right? So they want to study the behavior in context, right? To un so obviously, we can't understand what shaped Brazilian play by bringing a bunch of Brazilian players into a sterile lab environment, right? It's very likely that the, the environment that shaped that behavior is not going to be there anymore, right? So you need to be embedded in the, in the play. They also 
really importantly, and I think they they move away from this idea, the traditional idea of research, where a, a researcher is supposed to be distant and objective and not influence anything in any way. They are instead are doing the opposite. You hire the, the lead author on this paper is Brazilian, and there was no way they could have done the study without him because he was directly involved in, in, in the activities he was studying, right? So while he was, sometimes he played with them, he got them water, he did things, right? So he wasn't just standing back trying to describe what was going on, right? So he was being, he was embedded and involved, right? And along with this, and in the paper you can read, they're acknowledging this. Instead of trying to say that it doesn't occur, they're saying it happens, and here they're trying to acknowledge all points where there might be some bias and subjectivity. <coughs> so the emphasis is on the author's subjective interpretation of things rather than trying to do an objective description, which I think is, is a really, you have to do it this way, right? And kind of overall, right, this is a bigger issue, and I'm going to talk about throughout some of the papers. You know, this is a challenge that I've kind of faced in my career over the last few years is trying to switch methodology, right? A lot of the ideas in the ecological approach do not fit the methodology, statistics, analysis methods that I learned, right? And most people learn. For example, the, no, trying to treat people as individuals, right? Instead of groups does not fit with the way that I, I was taught statistics. So I need to learn a different way. So I think this idea of developing new methods is incredibly important for the field. In the, in the thing that, as I think I saw on the last slide, there was a mixed method. So there's some observation. There also was a lot of contextual analysis, looking at historical documents, cultural documents from Brazil and trying to un understand things. Um, they had 13 players. Critically, the, the lead author identified uh, different training environments to look at that ranged everything from very formal football clubs in Brazil all the way down to this very uh, informal palada, right? So importantly, another feature I, I think they're, they're emphasizing in this contextualized skill acquisition research is instead of trying, in the traditional experiment, you're trying to reduce variability, right? You're trying to make everything as consistent in your groups as possible, right? For example, you would never do a training study where some of your players trained in the beach and some of them trained in a soccer field, right? Unless that was a purposeful manipulation, that's no way, that's unwanted variability in your design that's going to make it unlikely you're going to get significant effects. You want to get rid of it. Here, they're trying to actually embrace it, right? And capture it. They're trying to find, cover all the, the variability in the context, right? So, as, you know, capture this rich context rather than take it in the lab and strip it down and reduce it, right? So I think that's another important uh, feature here. Um, so what did they find? So where they started in this was with this contextual analysis, focusing on this um, Brazilian contrast concept of malandragum, you know, that's probably pronounced wrong again, but I already lost the pronunciation, malandragem. Um Literally, that's a, a Portuguese word that means cunning, right? And it comes, it actually, you can identify the kind of people that are associated with it, um, malandro and malandra, which are tricksters. Basically, in my interpretation and in short form of this, what this is, is it's a, it's a type of behavior and a person that arose from the kind of the cultural, social cultural events in, in Brazil in which there was a lot of government co corruption, a lot of oppression, um, a lot of poverty, so that people needed to, in, to get things done, to get food, to get you know, medicine, they needed to go al around the law, right? Because the law wasn't supporting them. They needed to be deceptive and manipulative and trick trick tricksters, right? Uh, streetwise. And of course, like anything, this wasn't all done in a beneficial way, it, there, it, it also is associated with cr criminal, um, you know, not beneficial behavior, being criminal. So the basic idea is that this malandragium was uh, the idea of an anti-hero, right? Someone doing good. And these uh, characters are revered. You can find them in Brazilian culture over and over again in music, movies, advertisements, and so on, right? So if I had to relate this to, to my cultural background, you know, the Anglo-Saxon <laughs> cultural background, of course, the closest thing I could think of it, this is Robin Hood, right? Rob this is robbing from the rich to give to the poor kind of idea, a person that trick, you know, 
that is doing bad things for good, like it's trip tricking, deceptive people, deceiving people, going around the conventions and the rules for good, right? So that's the basic idea. And as I said, the authors highlight this is throughout Brazilian culture. And one of the things I love about this paper is they relate this to the idea of Bernstein's dexterity, right? So Bernstein's dexterity is the idea of coming up with different ways to solve a problem to be adaptive, right? Getting things done in different ways. And this malandragum is exactly that, right? It's trying to feed your family by going around the conventional way. It's trying to solve these problems by doing things, right? And so what they're arguing in this paper is that this um, kind of reverence for this, this uh, feature, this type of behavior has created a form of life in Brazil where this kind of dexterity is, is emphasized and revered and loved, right? So being deceptive or creative, going against uh, conventions, sometimes flaunting the rules is kind of an accepted thing because of this kind of anti-hero reverence from this, this, uh, this historical cultural background. And one of the best examples that you can think of of this is, is Neymar, right? Neymar, you know, if you're a soccer fan, I'm, you know, I'm a fan. I, most people know him for two things, right? One, he's an incredibly skilled soccer player, right? He's he, with the ball, but he's also one of the world's worst uh, divers, right? Most people are really get tired. He, he, so he's constantly trying to go around, flaunt the rules by get for his advantage, fake a dive so they get a free kick, right? So that's kind of an example. And in general, uh, you know, I've heard Brazil is one of the one countries people complain about for diving too often, right? So, so then that kind of fits within in their their this idea, this this cultural constraint, that form of life that's been created, right? This is a a, a really nice quote from the paper. I think that captures this. So this is from a, a player that was interviewed. I lived in a very rough neighborhood full of crime. We paid Pilata every day on the streets. We had players at various levels of skills and age. I was about six years old. So everybody knows that football has 17 rules, but in our street, there was only one rule. If no blood, no foul. Under this context, you create certain malandragum, trickery for the rest of your life. For example, I knew that if I bumped into a 15-year-old boy, I would break myself up. So I had to look over my shoulders all the time and anticipate the moves to avoid physical contact. In doing so, you develop quick thinking and the notion of searching for space and time to play. Right? So... This kind of, uh, you know, this kind of shaping in this culture, again, uh, leading to this more creative, more adaptive, more dexterous way of playing soccer, right? And they also relate this to another term that you sometimes hear um, associated with Brazilian soccer, jinga, jinga, which literally means body sway, right? And immediately when I hear that term, I think of Pele, right? Which is the top picture. I think that picture shows it great. Like everyone else is upright, <laughs> straight and upright. He's leaning sharply to the side. So Jinga is the, the specific movement coordination solution that emerges from this form of life, kind of. Um, and it's a movement solution where you're, you're doing much more un atypical, creative, uh, deceptive moves to try to fool your opponent, more fluid motion, and that that uh, GIF kind of shows that. The authors also give lots of other examples. For example, they talk about a type of pelada uh, that's usually played on Fridays in Brazil where the coaches actually join in the games. Um, sometimes there's way more players than 11 aside. Players play out of position, um, and they're usually a, a rewards for the winning team, but there's also rewards for players who score the most beautiful goal, right? And if you observe that, and I, I've actually seen that some, there's some Brazilian soccer clubs here in Arizona, which I've, I've, I've watched and uh, uh, interacted with a few times. And you do see in these games, players will be wide open for a shot and they'll add, still add some moves to it, right? So there's this kind of emphasis on style and flair and this beautiful game emphasis. Right. So overall, I think this is a really interesting study. It's a great read. I would definitely read. There's way more to the paper than I, I shared here. So I definitely go and seek it out and have a look. But as I said, I think and overall, this reflects uh, an important uh, issue that we need different methodologies, different analytical methods to understand things from an ecological approach. And I think this is the idea of contextualized skill acquisition research, studying a thing in context, being omitting your sub subjectivity, trying to capture all the variability of the, the environment is an important first step. Okay.
Thanks for joining me. Uh, cheers for now and keep them coupled.